Hello and welcome to this Blackwell Online podcast. My name is George Miller, and my guest today is Madeleine Bunting, whose book, The Plot, a biography of my father's English acre, has just been published in paperback. Robert McFarlane has called the book a borehole history of both an acre of England and Bunting's complicated father, which captures rather well Bunting's exploration of a patch of Yorkshire hillside, which her father first discovered as a teenager on D-Day. A decade later, he bought the land and set about erecting a chapel of remembrance on it in memory of the war dead. The building and all its artworks were handcrafted by Bunting's sculptor father. So intense were his feelings about this patch of land that Bunting as a girl felt excluded and alienated from it and couldn't wait to escape Yorkshire in her teens. Yet this book is a homecoming of sorts, or at least a coming to terms with her late father and all the layers of hidden history that his land contains. I suggested to Madeline that undertaking this book had been a brave, possibly risky venture. Yeah, I think I think that is absolutely right. For reasons that are not really in the book, in great detail, what this book meant I had to do was confront a lot of ghosts from the past, and uh, I'm not even sure I was aware of what I was doing. Funny enough, actually, somebody at one of my book readings came up to me and said, you know, this is so brave what you've done. And I looked at her, and this was about two months after publication, and I said, oh, brave, really? You know, I'm not sure, was it? And it's funny how, you know, your perspective on a book shifts. You know, mm. you've got the, the perspective you've got when you're actually writing the book, and then when it comes out, and then when you look back on the whole process and what you've done. And actually, only now can I see quite the bravery that was involved in it. It mm. was brave, and it was difficult. And actually, I think it brought me to confront you know, really, really difficult, difficult thing. Because the the emotions you describe that you had as a a child about your father's chapel and the the plot are ones of oppression and exclusion and alienation, really, aren't they? So that that those are those are sort of quite substantial feelings to have to confront. Yes, <laughs> short answer. Mm. Yes, yes, you're absolutely right, and and also. I mean, it's interesting because everybody, you know, what I find endlessly fascinating is everybody reads the book in such a sort of particular way. And what mm. you've identified is three, absolutely accurately, um, three strands, which are very sort of negative about the oppression and, and the rest of it. I think what made the legacy of my father so complex was alongside that sense of alienation and oppression uh, was also a sense of huge admiration and, and sort of this, you know, deep kind of almost kind of reverence really for, you know, my father's gift, which I think was really kind of central in the family, that we were all brought up to be, you know, deeply admiring of my father. So, you know, that makes for an incredibly sort of powerful ambivalence. You know, you're admiring something that is, you know, very excluding and uh, alienating. I absolutely agree. You sort of arrive at that sense of peace and resolution at the end of the book, but but you have to work hard for it, don't you? I mean, you as a writer have had to work hard in order to to achieve that. Yeah, and in, in the end, one friend, one close friend, had a very interesting reading of the book because they said, well, you know, at the, the end of all this, I'm still not quite sure that you've come to terms with your father and the place is still, you know, full of ambivalence. So what exactly, you know, was the point of it all? I found his comments really, really interesting because at, at one level, he's right, there's no easy solutions here. I'm not saying that, you know, I managed to sort it all out, as it were. I think I've come to a greater acceptance of the kind of paradoxical nature of it all. Mm. And that's not a very tidy conclusion to reach about a parent or about <laughs> one's relationship with a place. Um, but it's a truthful one. And, I mean, it has to be said that he gave you a wonderful bequest in the form of the, the richness of the stories that um, that this acre contains. I mean, that, that I was sort of constantly amazed by just how many strands of history were, were part of this story. The rich bequest is... Um it's actually true of, of any acre in the UK, mm. but it is such an amazingly rich landscape. You know, when I first arrived at my acre, I thought, God, I'm never going to find enough to write a book about here. And I often thought, I really have picked a pretty tough ch- challenge because this is such a sort of anonymous place. You know, you could easily kind of walk across this acre without noticing it as being, you know, any particular significance at all. Mm. And, and I think the thing there is about the, the kinds of skills of storytelling and story digging that my, you know, I've been kind of working at and developing all my working life. That, mm. You know, how you tell 
stories and enable people to see the extraordinary in the ordinary is kind of part and parcel of what I do every day. I'm not sure this age is particularly unusual, actually. I think it's, I think you could tell this kind of book about every single age in the UK. I enjoyed the connections you managed to make. You managed to make connections between the, the droving of livestock from York, well, from Scotland uh, through Yorkshire all the way down to the London meat market, yeah. not, not far from yeah. your... I mean, those connections must have given you pleasure when you managed to oh, yeah. make them. Definitely, yeah. No, that definitely was, was, there was something very satisfying about that. I think this was sort of mapping of place to place and life to life, uh, which is really appealing. And I think perhaps that sort of comes back from one's reading of Bruce Chapman's song line, the idea mm. that you can uh, really imagine a place through story and sort of navigate a place through story and that one story can lead you from one place and bring you to another place and to find sort of echoes of that in a kind of um, social historical research mm. so I could sort of find these kind of threads was immensely satisfying. And then to find the, the other extraordinary kind of connection between um, Alexander Bunting and the, the, the medieval soldier mm. who was passed mm. by the king and my nephew Alexander Bunting. <laughs> yeah. um, you, you know, there's a, there's a wonderful kind of circularity, how, how things come around again and, and again. The idea that Bunting's have been connected, you know, um, with this bit of land intermittently for centuries is astonishing because it makes you think, well, in another 700 years, what quite might the connection have developed and how might they kind of develop in the future? You know, you're, you're just aware that there's a kind of continuity of, of time and place here, which is well beyond the, you know, the very short span of your own life. Tell me about the understanding you came to of, of the significance of the, the chapel and the acre to your father, because it wasn't something which was talked about when you were young, as I, as I understand it. It was something you had to really investigate and, and feel your way towards. Yeah. Well, I think there was a lot, a lot that my father um, just did not talk about. That it was just implicit in his life, and you were just expected to sort of understand. And I think uh, for somebody who began to ask lots of questions, you know, it was just always really puzzling. The architecture of my father's life, his Catholic faith, his art, and you know, the chapel was just something that he never really talked about, curiously, mm. even though he was utterly consumed by these things. And I think the chapel worked on many, many levels for him. One was the strand here about the Second World War. He was that very rare, rare man of the early 20th century who did not fight in a, a world war. He was really sort of sandwiched between, his generation was sandwiched between those that fought in the First World War and those that fought in the Second World War and those that escaped, you know, that, that he was 18 in 1945 and he just missed it by a whisker. So all his teenage years, he grew up presuming he would, you know, be constructed to fight and that his response, you know, his generation had been called to sort of lay their lives down and sacrifice themselves for, for future generations. I mean, it's a concept that we find utterly alien if you think of sort of young people growing up now. The idea that a whole generation could be sacrificed for the future is, you know, just completely alien and my father to his amazement this you know didn't happen he ex grew up expecting a short life and ended up living his, uh, a full, full life and I think that sense of kind of almost the survivor's guilt and that's the one the one thing that he did say about the chapel and his reason for building it he wrote in a, a pamphlet autobiographical pamphlet which is, it had been a down payment on a debt he could never repay and I thought that the, the, the phrasing of that was very, very interesting because basically he could never pay it off. So he, you know, if one thinks of the burden of debt, you know, if, if one's quite conscientious and one wants to pay things off and his generation did not have an attitude towards debt like people now might, which is just, you know, that's fine, it's a fact of life. Mm. His generation was, you did not have debt. Debt was a sign of shame and you cleared your debt and you mustn't have debt. It was that kind of era of, of kind of much more sort of prudence with money. So I think the sense of of burden, of guilt, and the chapel was a constant sort of redemptive practice in his life. You know, he went and cut the grass and he repaired it and he kept it going. And it was a sense of, you know, keeping faith with this, you know, this astonishing moment in 1945 when he realized actually he was going to have a chance to fulfill his artistic ambition. 